Good afternoon and welcome. It's my great honor to welcome all of our special guests today to the Anna and John J. C. International Relations Complex. And we are very fortunate to have John C. and his family here, um, the home of the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Pardis Madavi, and I'm the acting dean. Um, and I'm delighted to be joined by a large contingent of our Corbell students today. For those of whom aren't here, we do have an overflow room. So thank you for those of you who are watching this on live stream downstairs in the forum. And hopefully we'll be able to get some of their, their questions as well. I personally came to the University of Denver last fall and fell in love with this beautiful city and community. It has been my great pleasure to work with such gifted faculty, staff, and students. I'm excited to see you second year's master's students graduate in just a few short months and can't wait to watch you change the world. So it'll be sad to see you go. <laughs> Before we get started, please know that Secretary Albright is eager to autograph your book. If you have not yet purchased a book, you may do so after the Q&A, and she has generously agreed to remain to autograph as many books as she can. Um, those will be set up uh, in the foyer. So thank you for that. So you all are here today to hear from this wonderful woman seated to my left, Madeline Corbell Albright. And for this audience, it probably goes without saying that Secretary Albright is the daughter of the first dean of our school, Dr. Joseph Corbell. I have to tell you, every day I feel that I have such big shoes to fill. So it's, it's really such an honor to have you here. And we'll be talking a little bit more about Joseph Corbell uh, in a moment. Secretary Albright is the chair of Albright Stonebridge Group, a global strategy firm and chair of Albright Capital Management, LLC, an investment advisory firm focused on emerging markets. Again, you all probably know this, but it gives me a great honor to introduce her. She was the 64th Secretary of State of the United States, and Dr. Albright received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor from President Obama on May 29, 2012. In 1997, Dr. Albright was named the first female Secretary of State and became at that time the highest ranking woman in the history of the United States government. As Secretary of State, Dr. Albright reinforced America's alliances, advocated for democracy and human rights, and promoted American trade, business, labor, and environmental standards abroad. From 1993 to 1997, Dr. Albright served as the United States Permanent Representative to the United Nations and was a member of the President's Cabinet. From 1989 to 1992, she served as president of the Center for National Policy. And previously, she was a member of President Jimmy Carter's National Security Council and White House staff and served as chief legislative assistant to US Senator Edmund S. Muskie. Dr. Albright is, as Chancellor Trapp would like to say, one of the most important jobs in the world. She is currently a professor in the practice of diplomacy at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service. She chairs the National Democratic Institute for International Affairs and serves as president of the Truman Scholarship Foundation. She serves on the United States Department of Defense's Defense Policy Board, a group tasked with providing the Secretary of Defense with independent, informed advice and opinion concerning matters of defense policy. Dr. Albright also serves on the boards of the Aspen Institute and the Center for American Progress. In 2009, Secretary Albright was asked by NATO Secretary General Anders Fogh Rasmussen to chair a group of experts focused on de developing NATO's new strategic concept. She is the author of five New York Times bestsellers, her autobiography, Madam Secretary, a memoir, The Mighty and the Almighty, Reflections on America, God, and World Affairs, Memo to the President, How We Can Restore America's Reputation and Leadership, Prague, Winter, A Personal Story of Remembrance and War from 1937 to 1948, and one of my personal favorites, Read My Pins, Stories from a Diplomat's <laughs> Jewel Box. Her latest book, Fascism, A Warning, was published in April of 2018. Dr. Albright received a BA with honors from Wellesley College and a master's and doctorate degrees from Columbia University's Department of Public Law and Government, as well as a certificate from its Russian Institute. She is based in Washington, DC. Secretary Albright, it is such a pleasure to have you here with us. We have over 100 students in the audience and many more in the conference room on the first floor. And everyone here is as eager as I am to learn lessons from you. Yeah. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much because this is home. And um, I was very uh, grateful to have grown up in Denver. And um, 
I was not a citizen when we came here, and I actually took my vows at the Denver court uh, between my sophomore and junior year at Wellesley, and I am a grateful American, and I always feel it everywhere, but especially when I come home to Denver. Well, welcome home. Thank you. Uh, so speaking of being welcomed home, I'd like to ask my first question about your father. Um, he appears throughout this book um, in, in very interesting ways from the moment where he decided to ignore the sirens in your London flat and stay behind to finish his radio script to the point where he goes as ambassador to warn then president about the um, threats to democracy that communism posed. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about if your father were alive today, what do you think he would make of the situation America is facing? And was he part of the inspiration for you in writing this book? Well, no question that he was the inspiration. He was the inspiration of everything that I've ever done. I was the perfect daughter. He's dead. I'm old. I'm still the perfect daughter. Uh, uh, and whatever he was working on, I would work on. So after he had been um, in his last job, which was representing Czechoslovakia on a new commission to do with India and Pakistan, I learned a lot about Kashmir. I wrote a paper on Gandhi. Whatever he was doing, um, I was into. But I, I really do think that part of his legacy was understanding democracy. And um, we spent an awful lot of time talking about that. And when he came to the United States, he did say that the most wonderful thing was to be a professor in a free country. But he was concerned that Americans were taking democracy for granted. Um, and, and I think he would be very worried now because that is what's happened. Uh, and a sense of not understanding fully enough that one had to fight for democracy. And the other part, I think the lessons of things that happened in Czechoslovakia specifically was the fact that the communists uh, took advantage of democratic institutions to undermine democracy because the democratic ministers and various people thought that those who didn't agree with them would obey the rules, and they didn't obey the mm -hmm. rules. And so that was the part, I think, that I would take out of all of this, and if I, there's nothing worse than speaking for the dead, but the bottom line is I do think that he would see exactly that which is going on, which is people taking advantage of our democracy uh, to, dis to undermine it, and the Russians specifically taking advantage of our uh, media uh, systems and the new technology, and so I think he would be warning um, that the way I am, and so I'm hoping that I am, in fact, being able to embody some of the things that he thought and to issue that warning, because that was something he had really, he sensed it the minute he got here. One, that he was honored and delighted and grateful to be here, but also being a little concerned that we were taking, that Americans were taking everything for granted. Mm -hmm. So speaking of being the perfect daughter, I'm hoping my daughter is going to take some lessons from, from you on that. Um, as, I was, as I was telling you, um, my daughter's a second grader, and I had the opportunity to go and help her classmates think about writing opinion pieces. And they were asking me, you know, what is it like to have an opinion and write about it? And I said, well, you have to write about something you feel strongly. And so I asked them, you know, for instance, people write a lot about the government. What is your feeling? Do you have a lot of trust in the government? And this is something you write about in your book. You know, the current situation we're in, the level of trust is, is so low. It's at a historic low. But you also talk about the future and thinking about the credit that America has shored up. Um, and and you, you pose a great question about the long-lasting effects of our current situation, this lack of trust. That really hit home for me when I was talking with a group of second graders in Denver who said, I asked them, do you trust the US government? And they said, no, why would we? And I said, why? And they said, the president doesn't have our interests at heart. So what do you make of that? And, and what do we think about the long lasting effects? Well, I'm overwhelmed that second graders <laughs> think that because <laughs> Me too. Um, some of the older people don't. Um, and, and I think that that is the problem, um, that there's not enough of an understanding of what is going on. And I. Uh, this comes, I have been studying an awful lot about what's happening internationally. Uh, as you pointed out, I'm chairman of the National Democratic Institute and spend a lot of time analyzing what is going on. And what has happened is democracy is at the lowest level. Freedom House has really been talking about the great damage that has been done to democracy in a lot of different ways. 
The part that I find that is so difficult to get my head around, which is that information is supposed to be the lifeblood of democracy. Mm -hmm. And yet people don't, are either listening to everything that they already agree with, uh, and people don't know where the information is coming from. And technology, which is a great boon in so many ways, also as a double-edged sword. So I have been um, analyzing, for instance, the Arab Spring, and how come what happened at Tahrir Square, how do you get from Tahrir Square to governance? And so the simplest way to put it is that people went to Tahrir Square on the basis of social media. Mm -hmm. um, also, I can't believe I'm saying this, but the elections were held too soon. Mm -hmm. And so the Muslim Brotherhood was organized, and the people in Tahrir Square were not. They were disaggregated voices, and political parties couldn't be formed. And so the Muslim Brotherhood wins. So it's a complete disaster in many different ways. And then there is this mythical middle-aged man that I talk about who lives outside of Cairo, wants to come in in order to open his souk, uh, his uh, stall in the souk, and it's a mess in Tahrir Square. And so he says, I want order. And so all of a sudden, General Sisi mm -hmm. becomes president and they have order where the capital O. So how does this happen? And the thing that I, by the way, to the students, this is unacceptable because what I'm saying is I plagiarized. Um, I, got, I was in Silicon Valley and somebody came up with, I think, a terrific summary of what's going on. People are talking to their governments on 21st century technologies. The governments listen to them on 20th century mm. technology and are providing 19th century responses. Mm. So there is no faith in the government because they are not responding to the needs of the people uh, in so many different ways. Uh, and therefore, you know, there, there's a way that democracy kind of seems um, messy, takes too long. Mm -hmm. And there is always this issue, and again, graduate students study that all of us did, is what comes first, political development or economic development? Mm -hmm. And they go together because people want to vote and eat. And so there is this discussion, and what is it that the government really does and to go even deeper is the social contract is broken. Mm -hmm. um, I think people gave up their individual rights to be in a system that has a government that takes some responsibility for their well-being um, and provide roads and schools and all that. Um, and at the same time, the citizens are not doing what they need to do. Their, our responsibility is to vote and be a part of things. So there's disconnect across the board. Mm -hmm. So you, you talked about El Sisi, and, um, and in the book, you talk a lot about Erdogan. And you, know, you have the, the chapter on his role. Um, last year, I was part of an organization called Scholars at Risk, where we seek to provide aid to academics who are hunted around the world for a lack of academic freedom. Um, in 2016 alone, there were more Turkish scholars than any other scholars around the world who needed immediate attention because they were literally being hunted. Um, in Iran, we saw the same thing with increasing numbers of academics arrested and placed in Evin prison, which I think, as I mentioned to you, at a certain point, people were calling it Evin University mm -hmm. because all the professors were locked up and, and graduate students were joking about trying to get arrested so they could finish their dissertations, right? <laughs> um, so why do you think academics <clears throat> pose such a major threat to fascism and what can be done about it? Well, I think that <clears throat> um, the issue really is that the role of academics is to um, uncover what the truth is and to, to allow students to explore what they think and mm -hmm. to be uh, respectful of diversity of opinions and, and, in fact, to encourage it. I think that the thing that I love about teaching uh, is when students challenge me. Um, and it makes the professor think and it makes the other students think. And it's all based on this capability that a good academic has of eliciting different opinions and yet putting it into some kind of a context. That is terrifying right. to authoritarian mm -hmm. figures uh, because they think that they have um, been anointed or something in order to uh, provide their version of truth. And if there's anybody that questions it, then they become an enemy of the people. The part of the problem is that this is something that happens slowly. So Erdogan is a very interesting example, and Turkey in so many different ways. I've been fascinated by Turkey for a long time. Um, I worked in the Carter administration when it was the first, we lifted an embargo that had been put on Turkey because of actions that they'd taken in Cyprus. And 
Um, and I spent a lot of time studying Turkey. Um, and it, it's a fascinating place um, because of its geographical location. You talked about your daughter. My granddaughter, when I took her there, um, summarized everything when she said, I understand Turkey now. We spent the night in Europe and had lunch in Asia. Uh, and it That's pretty much great. summarizes that it. But the bottom line is geographically an incredibly important place. And what had happened there was that they had a series of governments that were either uh, came in by military coups uh, or were a bunch of uh, snobby people that lived on the other side of the Bosporus. And so they were not delivering uh, constituency services. So Erdogan um, was somebody that was able to uh, create a party that did do constituency services, and he got elected fair and square. There's no question about it. Then, all of a sudden, um, there was, there's no other way to describe it, but power went to his head. And he began accumulating more and more power, and then doing something which is a very, very bad sign, and is true in a lot of places, changing the Constitution. Mm -hmm. He wants to make sure that he has a lifetime term. The Chinese just did that. Um, and I think that when there is an attempt to do that, that is one of the really uh, uh, devastating signs. And so he has now arrested uh, thousands of uh, academics, thousands of journalists, right. Right. thousands of people that had worked in a variety of different places. And uh, I have him, what I do, this really is a book that is history. I do begin with Mussolini um, and Hitler, but I'm looking at some current uh, governments that are going in a fascist mm -hmm. direction. Mm -hmm. uh, Turkey, Poland, Hungary, Philippines, Venezuela are the ones that I've kind of focused on, mm -hmm. where all of a sudden there is this leader who was elected, this is the part that's creepy, that then uh, in fact uses all that power to limit power for everybody else. Mm -hmm. What we've heard Fareed Zakaria term, illiberal democracies, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, so you spoke a little bit about your role as an academic, as a professor and in the classroom. And you write in the book about how fascism as a discursive trope has become fashion, in a sense, yeah. when your, your colleague kind of mistook the title. But you know, in a sense, meaning that people level the trope as accusation against people with whom they disagree. Um, here on college campuses, we see this unfortunate fashion uh, rear, rearing its ugly head um, and in that people are leveling you know, that trope of fascism on multiple sides as an accusation. Um, what do you think we can do about this, you know, in, in, the, the, in higher education and how kind of this trope has infiltrated? And then on the flip side, what is the role of higher education in combating fascism? Well, first of all, I do think um, when you don't like somebody, you call them a fascist. Right. Um, and it seems like it hits, I mean, you can even, I mean, you have a nice daughter, but, but the bottom <laughs> line, might, there yeah, are kids it. who, when they're parents don't let them use the car, call them fascists, right. you know. <laughs> and so it's just something that seems like it's the ultimate way to, to discredit somebody. Right. Um, I have to say, it's not easy to define fascism. Um, and I have tried that in the book. And it really, kind of my explanation of it is, it's not an ideology. It's a systematic way to, um, to destroy a democratic system. But it's basically identifying with a group that is normally highly nationalistic, tribal, um, and discrediting people that are not in it. So it becomes very much an us versus them activity. Then to make sure that the people that are them uh, have no rights at all. And if they're foreigners um, and migrants, then they are definitely responsible for everything that goes wrong, mm -hmm. including being terrorists and rapists and all that. Then there is a lack of regard for the free press um, and calling the free press an enemy of the people. Then there is a way of undermining civil society generally, anything that isn't kind of controlled by the top, and using uh, big rallies and things and uniforms and salutes um, to make sure that the message gets across in some particular way. No respect for any democratic institutions, and having the leader be above the law. Right. And so, and then ultimately, and I think this is the, the part that really gets to the nub of it, is using violence in order to get what you want. And so a fascist leader is somebody who identifies with the group, disrespects the right of others, and has a military 
to in, uh, impose views, mm -hmm. so kind of a bully with an army. But it is not an easy, uh, def it's not easy to define, mm -hmm. but it has that combination of things of undermining free thought in every way, which leads to the question about an academic setting. It is the job of an academic setting is to try, it's not easy to find truth. I have to agree with that. I mean, what we learn in an academy is to actually look at a lot of different sources and compare things. And, um, and I, uh, you're Iranian, so I'm going to tell you this story. One of the things that I did uh, when I first started teaching was to look at what happened during the hostage crisis. And I did this all on the basis of published memoirs and material. Um, and, you know, uh, Secretary Vance had written about it, Harold Brown, a lot of different people. And I did categories about where did people get their information, who did they trust, uh, who were their allies within the U.S. government, who did they consider as undercutting them. And in, across the board, everything was slightly different. Mm. And it made me realize that everybody sees things a little bit differently. I have been accused of being a relativist, that I can't say there's absolute truth. But I do think that there are aspects that you can learn by doing comparisons. And that's what a university does, is encourage research and have people try to find uh, where the information comes from. Mm -hmm. And then I do think, as I said earlier, the most important thing is to elicit different views from your students mm -hmm. and make them feel comfortable. And then, and this is an essential part, make them be respectful of other people's opinions. Um, you cannot shout down people that you disagree with. Um, and I think that the most important thing is to encourage civil discourse and recognize that some people may think differently um, and then try to persuade them through civil discourse. Mm -hmm. But I think what I'm very troubled by is when the universities now uh, do not want to have speakers that they disagree with. Mm -hmm. I've been demonstrated against. It's not much fun. Um, but I, as, as I, and I literally just was last week, and I said, I believe in freedom of speech. They, however, never let me answer. And so I think that that's what the most important part is. Ask the questions, let the person you disagree with answer. Because mm -hmm. the price for lack of free speech and academic yeah. freedom is, yeah. is pretty it's, high. And that's what it's all about. Right. Yeah. So you've talked a lot about the role of, of the press. Um, one of the things I noticed in the book is, is you also ta refer to um, actors, people like Charlie Chaplin, and, 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 and um, I'm wondering what you think the role of Hollywood is, because of course a lot of people also get their information or their, their tropes about particular issues through Hollywood. I work on human trafficking, and I know unfortunately the film Taken uh, became yeah. kind of the basis for a lot of people's information on human trafficking. So what would you say the role of, of Hollywood is? And I know that you have some experience. I'm a big fan of Gilmore Girls, yeah. as, Ma as well as Madam Secretary. I loved your appearance in, yeah. in both of those shows. Um, so tell me what you think of uh, the role of Hollywood is. Well, I think, again, mixed. But let me just say the following things. I think that when an actor takes up a cause, um, it makes a big difference. It and it's very important because actors aren't stupid. Um, and I think, for instance, what George Clooney has done right. has been very uh, important in terms of a lot of aspects of, of um, or Richard Gere in Tibet, any number of things, that they can bring issues to the fore mm -hmm. um, in a very positive way. I also think, um, in defense of my television watching and acting, <laughs> is that the bottom line is that there are, um, that you can hook people on a story and really be giving an important message. I used to watch something called Army Wives, which really <laughs> yes. did explain how difficult it was for wives of uh, deployed military and raised a lot of issues. So um, I, I'm almost embarrassed about this or not, but what happened was I got a call from the producers of Gilmore Girls and they said, would you mind if somebody played you? And I said, yes, I would. I want to play myself. <laughs> I you know? So I wa and I made the excuse of why this was OK for me to do. For any of you that watched Gilmore Girls, um, the, the, you know, Rory, Rory yeah. was leaving college. Yeah. And the whole point was to get her to go back to college. So I thought it was an educational yeah. thing <laughs> that I was doing. And so I was participating in something educational. And the bottom line is, it was harder than I thought because all of that had to be memorized, um, and it always was the same thing. And um, so the whole scene was 
this was always on Rory's birthday, her mother got into bed beside her, and she was, uh, so I went through all this, and um, my daughter's, one of, my youngest daughter actually looks like Rory, and so she called, she said, Mom, you were just playing yourself. Um, but it, that was my excuse. On uh, I did Parks and Recreation, too, oh. about that. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, uh, I missed that yeah. one. <laughs> and the reason I got asked to do that, because I was part of the show. When it first started, uh, Amy Poehler had a picture of me on her desk, right, yeah. and some, uh, somebody who was trying to date her said, is that your grandmother? And she said, no, and I'm not going to date anybody that doesn't know who Madeleine Albright is. Oh you know, so that, good answer. Yeah. A good uh, answer. And then, Madam Secretary, I do have to tell you about this, which is that uh, Taylor Taylor. came to me, and she said, I want to meet with you to talk about what it's like to be secretary, what the job is. So we're sitting, and I'm trying to explain to this woman what it's about. And I thought, I must be out of my mind. Why am I being serious about? Anyway, the writers then came up to me, and um, they were very interested in what we were doing. And so then what happens, you, some of you have probably now read about the White House Correspondence Dinner. So about three years ago, um, CBS and the whole cast asked me to be their guest. And we're walking into that, and people would say, Madam Secretary, and she would turn around. <laughs> But I did do a segment on that, and I'm happy to do many things, but I would not want to be on that too much. It took five hours to film this tiny little segment. Oh, wow. Yeah, so. so maybe the Hollywood is yeah. not. <laughs> but I do think Hollywood is important. The only time that I have, uh, at the end, of, I don't want to spoil the end of the book, um, but, but basically I talk about three dreams, um, that are ha bad dreams. Nightmares. One is a takeover by the right wing in a number of different ways but also about um, Hollywood taking over and kind of very far left wing. Uh, and then the third one is if there's some terrorist event. So I, I am not an extremist, um, and, and I do, I'm a centrist. And so I am concerned about money coming in um, that is very specific to something and does not, in fact, allow for uh, civil discourse. So I have one last question for you before we open it up. Um, one of the things I think that's so powerful ab about the book is it sort of makes the case that you know the successes of certain fascist movements build on each other, if you will. So the, yeah. the momentum you, you have Mussolini, Hitler, and then kind of it, it, it you, you chronicle this this interesting progress. And we fast forward to sort of the mo the present moment as well, where you have the successes of kind of nefarious or autocratic regimes building on each other. If we take it from the more positive angle, we might think about. Um, the question of hope uh, in the terms of the successes of some movements that we see today, such as the hashtag Me Too movement and the hashtag uh, Enough, you know, young people sort of leading the way uh, against gun violence or on women's rights against sexual assault. Um, do you see hope in these movements in terms of combating the sort of plucking of the feathers, if, if you will? Definitely. Let me just say kind of my motto for this book, you know, we've all seen that uh, see something, say something, I've added to it, do something. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of my to-do list is really to be supportive. I'm just um, so moved by the children, actually, that went out um, and demonstrated after Parkland, and they've now been joined across the country, of uh, children that are out there um, saying that they want to be involved, they want to hear from their members of Congress, uh, they're holding um, town hall meetings because they want some gun sanity so they don't have to go to school in flak jackets. And so I think that's very important. And I do think it is important. We cannot operate on the basis of fear. We have to operate on the basis of hope. Um, and so I am definitely. I'm, and But part of it, is, it goes with the other part, which is listening to those um, that, dis that you disagree with. Mm -hmm. And it's a very strange time because I do think it's not easy to make clear, speak with certainty about things that you believe in, be strong, go out there and demonstrate, but at the same time say, listen to those people that you think are um, really undermining everything. I think the hardest part, and I, and I speak, I did spend a lot of time campaigning, I have over the years, the hardest part is to speak to people who disagree with you um, and who you know are going to vote some other way without being very you know, snooty about them or 
um, disrespecting them. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that. I mean, that is part of what's really, we have to be very clear about that they have beliefs um, that for whatever reason they've developed and to argue with it in a, um, in a really respectful way, I think is important. It's a great message yeah. to end on. Thank yeah. you, Secretary Thank you. Albright. Yeah. Um, So we would now like to open it up uh, for questions. Uh, and there's a mic on this side of the room, and, and um, Ivy and Alicia will be able to help pass, pass the mic around. So if you just sort of raise your hand, I'll do my best. Uh, yeah, Ale Alexis, uh, in the back. Um, Ivy, let's go with, back. she's back there. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Alexis Minocal Harrigan. I am a Corbell alumna. Um, I currently work for Governor Hickenlooper as his education policy advisor. Um, I would love your opinion and advice. Um, I, I come from the public sector, I've worked for um, several elected officials. I've seen um, many women face this glass ceiling in public service, particularly women of color. Um, any advice for um, my colleagues who are looking to advance in public service and, and how to um, push our careers forward? Thank you. Well, I think we've all faced that in some form or another. Um, and I do think that part of it has to do in supporting each other in the first place. Um, I, uh, the most famous thing I've ever said is that there's a special place in hell for women who don't help each other. Uh, it was so famous that it ended up on a Starbucks cup. Uh, um, and it comes out of my own experience because, by the way, I went to college sometime between the invention of the iPad and the discovery of fire, so things are a little different. But, um, but basically, part of my problem was when I started graduate school, and I had uh, year-old twins, were other women who kind of said, why aren't you at home taking care of your children or in the carpool line, and besides, my hollandaise sauce is so much better than yours, and, um, and just generally putting me down. Then there was the issue, uh, when I finally got into the government, that I was always the only person in the room, only woman in the room. And so what happened was I would think that I wanted to say something, and then I'd think, well, it'll sound stupid. And then some man said it, uh, and everybody thought it was brilliant, and the men supported each other, you know, as Joe said. And if there had been another woman in the room, we could have supported each other. And so I think that that's one of the aspects. We need to help each other so that we're not the only woman in the room. And then I really do think that uh, we need to do this on a basis. By the way, I'm, as, when I became Secretary of State, I made women's issues central to American foreign policy, not just because I'm a feminist, but because it made sense. More than half the population in every country is female. So it's loss of a resource. And I think the same thing is true in the United States. It has to be viewed as a practical thing but we need to want to have other women around, and definitely not the Queen Bee syndrome, which is if there's only one woman in the room, it's going to be me and not you. Mm -hmm. okay. um. Secretary Albright, thank you very much for coming today and for your uh, warning. And since you're, in my mind, one of the premier diplomats, even though we have um, um, Ambassador Hill here as well. Um, my question though is, I agree with you that we need to talk to uh, people with different points of view, but when their point of view is based on hate and exclusion, how would you start that dialogue? I, I would like to know so I can use that technique as well. I think, um, let me just say, when you're talking about diplomacy, and I'll get to the more specific part of your question, I have, um, told my students, and I did this when I was in office, you try to put yourself into the other person's shoes to figure out what, where they're coming from and why they are saying what they're saying. Um, it's not easy, uh, and it's very difficult if you think the person is a total jerk. But the bottom line is, I do think that it's important at least to begin that way to find out. Um, I do think that one of the ways um, is that you need to say to somebody, I disagree with you, but I'm prepared to hear what you have to say, but you have to be prepared to hear what I have to say. And just flat out recognize that you're in a different place. Um, and uh, there's a certain level of honesty that I think is truly necessary for that. The part, and 
dipl diplomacy is the following thing. There's kind of a question of why would you talk to some horrible leader that is a despot? Um, talking is not a, not a gift. It's the way diplomacy is something that is a tool that is required in order to find out what's going on. And um, I always love it. I, I have a lot of friends, and we talk about what diplomacy is. And the French are really good at coming up with some really cynical point of view. So one of my friends is a former French foreign minister, and he came up with the best term. He said, diplomacy is the way that you can talk to monsters, um, and because it is a tool. And I think the same thing is true if you see having a conversation with somebody you disagree with as a tool to try to figure out where they're coming from. But it's not easy, and especially when they start yelling at you. Yeah. That's true. Um, yeah, right, right here. Yeah, in the, in the purple. Right, Ivy. Right, yeah, go ahead. Use it. Hi, Secretary Albright. Um, it's a pleasure meeting you. Um, but my question is, is that we're seeing uh, Jacksonian politics make a return in American um, discourse. Do you see, and this has been a dramatic shift from our pre the previous 20 years, do you see this uh, remaining for a while, or do you see this uh, shift back to more Hamiltonian and Wilsonian politics? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I don't know how many of you have um, read Walter Russell Mead in terms of identifying who is a Wilsonian and a Jacksonian and a Jeffersonian. Um, and, and I do think the truth is that at the moment populism has gotten a bad name, but if you think about democracy, it's about people. Um, and I think the question is how to use that interest coming bottom up in a way that turns people in the right direction uh, and allows people to have their voices heard. The thing that worries me, and this is the connection and how one gets to fascism, is that um, their fascism, in contrast to just plain old authoritarianism, is that it is taking what's coming bottom up in terms of people's unhappiness over divisions or lack of jobs or whatever, and then uh, coming from the top, giving them some simplistic answer, and then using them, their disquiet, in a way to undermine the system. But I think we need to have some recognition that populism and Jacksonianism is not bad. We are a democracy. The thing that gets lost in it is the us versus them part, and to try to remember that our constitution is we the people and not us versus them. Uh, yeah, in, in the back? Right yeah, right, yeah. Hello, thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. You've had such a distinguished career. Um, but I'd like to talk about what you have referred to as your biggest regret. So the situation in Rwanda and Somalia, um, that was during a time of international cooperation. Obviously, I don't agree with fascism, but how do you solve issues such as those dealing with genocide when you are trying to get everyone to cooperate, but nobody wants to take the responsibility? Well, you'll be so sorry you asked this. Uh, <laughs> uh, I do teach this course. Um, and I've now gone through the whole toolbox, and we have done two sessions, one on humanitarian intervention and one on counterterrorism to see how the tools all fit together. So I have gone back and looked an awful lot on the issues of humanitarian intervention, and also, because I was at the UN at a magical time, I have to say. Uh, the Russians had decided that they weren't going to veto things. President, First President Bush had put together a coalition of the willing, to do the Gulf War a number of different ways. And one of the interesting parts there at the time was the development of the peacekeepers. Um, and I learned an awful lot at the time. There were 60,000 peacekeepers that were out there. And the, the office in New York was the global emergency number. It, the only problem was it was only open from 9 to 5 and not on weekends. And so the question was how to evolve this incredible tool that had been set up by the UN Charter um, in a way of how it would really work. There had not been, peacekeepers used to be people that would only go in to keep the peace after an agreement had been made. So I'm there and we're talking about all these things that are going on. Um, and part of the issue that I make my students think about is what are all the issues that are happening at the same time? What are the capabilities? 
So at the beginning, uh, we were doing things in Bosnia. The Somalia um, whole adventure had begun as a feeding operation started by the Bush administration during the transition and trying to get it to become a UN operation. Um, then there were problems in Haiti. We were trying to do something. Um, and there was violence there, and this, the big uh, aircraft carrier of Harlan County had to be turned around. Anyway, the other part that is really important on Rwanda, and this is a part that is essential to all of this, and you can either believe this or not, but at the time we did not have information. It didn't even make the Security Council list for a long time. It never was out there, um, and all of a sudden, uh, something that had been um, uh, there were problems between the Hutus and Tutsis, and it became, became volcanic genocide. Um, and I have regretted it, so has President Clinton, but the issue is we did not have the information, and we were involved in other things. And these humanitarian interventions, I've just told my students, are the damned if you do, damned if you don't um, aspect of it. And so people are wondering, why aren't we doing something about Syria now? That is genocide. They are using chemical weapons to kill people, and yet there are real questions about what we do when, what are the sources, and do we have a responsibility to each other. The thing that I find interesting is um, Secretary General Gutierrez has now recognized something um, that should have been evident a long time ago. What do we do to prevent these kinds of situations in the first place, and what do we do when military has done its job and it's over in terms of reconstruction. Um, we have been talking previously about Kosovo. Mm -hmm. uh, Americans are the most generous people in the world with the shortest attention span. And we kind of think that once we've done something, it's done. And yet there is this whole spectrum. But the international community has looked at things, responsibility to protect, um, and all this. And the question is, what tool do you use? When do you use it? Is it in US national interest? We know what to do if America's attacked or our allies are attacked, but there are these damned if you do, damned if you don't. And I find it very hard, and I can't really, I know why we didn't do Rwanda, uh, and I know what happened. I didn't like my instructions. I have some feeling for Nikki Haley recently. Uh, and um, I tried to get my instructions changed, and I couldn't get them changed. Um, but it was something we didn't have the right information. And the worst part about it is, even if we had wanted to do something, it was volcanic, and we couldn't get in there fast enough. There has been rolling genocide in the Sudan. It was declared genocide, and we still didn't do anything about it, because it is one of the damned if you do, damned if you don't. You know, so. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. You want to get that? All right, maybe. <laughs> oh, from the front. <laughs> Uh, Secretary Albright, uh, what is uh, your opinion on the current state of the uh, Foreign Service, and what do you believe the Foreign Service uh, will need to do uh, in the future to, be in, uh, to remain relevant and a vital tool of the uh, United States? Um, I am deeply, deeply troubled by what is going on. I obviously uh, uh, believe in diplomacy and, the, and, in many ways, the primacy of the State Department. It's the oldest department in the U.S. government. And, and I do believe that in the toolbox, um, it, diplomacy is the, the bread and butter, the, the major tool um, in um, cooperation with others. So that uh, Secretary Mattis actually said, unless uh, the State Department gets more money, he's going to have to have more bullets. And so um, very often, the Defense Department understands really well what the State Department needs to do. I was outraged by... Um, the budget that came forward, the so-called skinny budget that initially came uh, from the Office of Management and Budget. Um, and by the way, one of the things, just so you know about the budget process, uh, it is a way that each department goes to the Office of Management and Budget. They put down a budget. The thing that used to happen during the Clinton administration, we would be able to go and argue in front of the president with the other uh, departments there about why we needed more money. Then I had an extra trick. Um, I would always call President Clinton on Christmas Eve and tell him I needed a little bit more money for USAID, <laughs> and I usually got it. So, um, but but I, I do think that the thing that happens um, is that not only did Secretary Tillerson um, 
have a reorganization, but when Congress tried to give him extra money, he turned it down. And at the same time, there was no respect whatsoever for foreign service officers. And there was really a sense that they were not, uh, many of them were not loyal because they had worked um, for the Obama administration and previously for the Clinton administration. And by the way, one of the things that I remember, I, I love being Secretary of State, believe it or, you know, I'm sure those of you that know me know that. And I, I wished I could have done it forever. And I was really jealous of foreign service officers that got to stay. And then I thought, it's not easy to work for different administrations. But they are loyal Americans, not partisan. And so I have been very concerned about what's been going on uh, with the State Department and the Foreign Service officers, and by the way, the civil servants, who are people that are work with the Foreign Service officers. And um, one of the positive things that I heard in Pompeo's um, hearings was that he planned to do more to resurrect the State Department. Uh, part of the issue, though, is that uh, it takes a while to get the ambassadors nominated and cleared. Uh, and then the part, and this is appropriate to talk about um, in this setting, and uh, those of you that are interested in the Foreign Service and Foreign Relations, is I know what's happening with my students at Georgetown. A number of them come and say, why should we take the Foreign Service exam? Um, and so in addition to the overall problem now, it's the problem about cutting off the pipeline. So I do hope that people that are interested in Foreign Service do take the Foreign Service exam and go into the government. Now, there are those people who will say, I don't want to be associated with the Trump administration. I hate to tell you this, but you're not going to have high-level policy jobs. Uh, and <laughs> it is uh, uh, actually worth being there and knowing what goes on and how you can learn what the system is about. So take the exam and go. Yeah. Last question. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, Secretary Albright. My name is Eleanor. I'm a junior undergrad at Corbell. Um, we're here talking about your book, and I recently listened to a podcast that you were on, and you mentioned that President Clinton would have required reading for you. So kind of an ending, what book do you wish everyone would read? Well, this mine, obviously. <laughs> Besides, of course, yours. Well, but <laughs> Let me just say, there is not one book. I really don't think so. In a weird way, one of the books that I recommend to everybody is War and Peace. The bottom line is most of us read it um, when we were in high school, and the girls liked the romance and the boys liked the battles. But the bottom line is there's so much wisdom in it. The only thing that I don't agree with is the fatalism of Leo Tolstoy. But one of the things that I read to my class is this part where he says, the higher you are in the government, the less influence you actually have. Um, and I think that's kind of an interesting point. But I actually, to go back, since one of the major problems that we're having, and I haven't been asked a question on it, is what's going on in the Middle East. And the book that the president told me to read was a book called The Peace to End All Peace mm. by David Fromkin, mm. which describes the history of the modern Middle East. And the short version of the book is that um, the modern Middle East was created by the British and French bureaucracies lying to each other um, and creating artificial countries to a great extent um, and then trying to meddle in what their activities were. And the reason that I think it's still a very good book to read is because I think we need to understand more and more the historical context of the things that are happening now in international relations which is the reason that in my book I go back to so much history, because we are all the products of our own background, but countries have memories. And one of the issues at the moment that I think really needs to be looked at is hypernationalism, which really comes from people feeling that their country either was disrespected and they look for some reason that that happened, or that the refugees that are coming out of the troubled Middle East or Africa because of desertification. And uh, there is, climate change is real, the earth is not flat. Um, <laughs> but, but that we need to understand the historical context. So any book that gives you a historical context of issues that are going on now, I think is very much worth reading. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Secretary Albright. We know how busy you are. And it, thank you all. Thanks so much for coming. It means yeah. so much to us thank for you, you to be here. Thank you. Thank you.